The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Benjamin J. Heckendorn was a mild-mannered graphic artist until he was bitten by the electronics bug. Now, every week he takes on new projects, shares tips and tricks, and answers your viewer questions on The Ben Heck Show. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we're going to focus on pinball. We'll start with an outline of what it takes to make a pinball game, and then go into more detail on the electronic aspects. Let's get started. But first, the news. Today in Ben News, I'm getting ready to go to the 2013 Midwest Gaming Classic. It is a video game convention that is held in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and it's been going on for the last 10 years. And fun fact, I actually won a contest back in the day, I think 2002 or so, to name it. So that's fun. Anyway, they have a lot of video games there you can play, arcade machines, vendors, and of course, pinball. So that's what I'm looking forward to. I'm also excited about showing people my Ghost Squad game and you know, seeing people play it, that's always the best part. And what they like, what they don't like, and maybe getting some suggestions to tweak it in the future. And of course, to see all my friends from the area. So yes, that's what I'm looking forward to this week. If I can make it in time. I mean, I'm trying to get Ghost Squad done. We'll see. So with our idea, we thought, hey, ghost hunting TV shows, everyone knows what they are. It's definitely ripe for comedy, so that's our theme. And it's an original theme too, so you know we don't have to pay for a license. Next comes the play field. You start with a standard layout, two flippers, slings, uh, plunger, and then you kind of build a game around it. And it's really easy to use foam core, AKA Nordmanite. Use this and hot glue and you can quickly make and change things. And the rule of thumb is if the ball shoots well on something as frictiony as friction as foam core, it'll certainly shoot well once you have it in plastic and metal. So nothing wrong with hot glue and exacto knives and whatnot. Then you start working on your rules, modes, and riding. Modes are like the uh, levels in a video game. In a pinball machine, there's different modes like, oh, I'm doing this, I'm fighting this ghost, I'm going to this place. Rules are kind of how you advance through the modes. And then writing involves the kind of dialogue you hear in the game, which helps the player understand what's going on and what they should do. It's like in a video game where they're like, get over that hill and blow up that tank. You know, that tells you what to do. Then once you have that, you program it. Programming is kind of driven by the modes and the rules, not kind of, it is driven by the modes, rules, and writing. So programming, you basically have your modes and they all work. And then of course you have to do a lot of testing and whatnot. Finally, there's hardware and assembly where you take all your components, like your solenoids, switches, you hook them up to your driver board, and then you make it all work. And assembly, you actually put the game together. Since this is an electronic show, we're going to be concentrating on the hardware and assembly portions of the project. Now we're gonna move on to the electronics. I have this new pinball driver board that I designed. It's a lot smaller than the old board that I designed. So I'm going to install this on my Ghost Squad game and then switch the code over. It's, these boards are pretty similar, but they're a little different. Switch the code over so it'll work on this board. So that's what I'm gonna do right now. Jolene, Jolene, your mama was so mean. How mean was she? She left you by the railroad tracks. I wish that rhymed with the week or the month or something. Where's my magic markers? I need them to label these molecs. The old one had this uh, ribbon cable for the accessory port. This one has a molex, which is the proper way to do it. This means I'm gonna have to rewire my accessory port, but one step at a time. So this has a chip kit on it, which is a PIC32 based development board. I am programming it right now. And the first thing we're gonna do is test the switch matrix. Because a friend of mine who I built one of these boards for as well said there were some issues with it. So we will take a look at that first. And we're gonna be using the serial monitor. So this board will be sending the data serially to the computer so we can see what's going on. So here's a serial monitor showing what we're getting from the switch matrix. This is test mode. And our switch matrix is written down on a sheet here. Now we're not using these two columns, so we only have six values showing up on the screen. So what we're looking at are the bitwise values for all of these. So for instance, column seven, which is indicated by this leftmost number here, that has all our balls in it if we put them in the trough. So if we put four balls in the trough, we'll see four ones show up on the screen. Each one of these bits indicating a ball. And I think we can actually get a fifth ball in there. I seem to have a fifth ball, I'll just use my finger. There, there's the fifth ball. So this is running off the new board. 
And I'm just gonna go through and make sure all the switches work and I can do it by watching the screen here and cross reference it to my sheet. It looks like a mess, but there is some order to it. These white, thicker wires here, those are the power wires for the solenoids, the coils. Down here, this lower section, all this stuff, those are the insert lights. I wired those first since they were the closest to the board, like the lower layer. Then above that, we have all the switches, like what you hit and the targets and whatnot. And those are in these bundles here. We basically have a bundle of switch column and switch row. And then all those switches come around here, and they're all bunched up at the end and come off the end of the table. So it kind of looks like a mess, but there's some semblance to it. When you actually manufacture a game, you know all the lengths of the wires already, so you can make it look nice and neat. But this is a prototype. With Earth Day coming up on April 22nd, I think to myself, self, isn't it cool when engineering can be used for good instead of evil, like when we can use it to help protect the environment? One of the most innovative ways to do this is through energy harvesting. This technology helps engineers tap into all sorts of energy all around us, including thermal, solar, and motion. In honor of Earth Day, all throughout the month of April, Element 14, in conjunction with leading suppliers, is hosting a series of energy harvesting activities on the Element 14 community, including an exciting design challenge competition. During the challenge, five engineers are going to use energy harvesting to build new products, which will help us get rid of the old, wasteful ones. It's going to be really exciting. Check it out and add your thoughts. The folks working on it will appreciate your comments and support. Visit element14.com forward slash energy harvesting solutions for contest details, including criteria and judging, and to keep up to date on the latest in energy harvesting and engineering solutions. And now, back to the show. The new board has been installed on the existing Ghost Squad game. So I'm gonna go over the features of it and tell you what each feature does for the game itself. Here we have our ATX power supply input. You can use pretty much any PC power supply. You don't need it to be that big. We have our chip kit, which is a PIC32 based development board. This is great because you can just kind of plug it in. I mean, it'd be cheaper to embed the board, but it's easier just to plug this whole thing in. Over here, we have a bunch of TIP 107s and TIP 102s, which are Darlington transistors, uh, NPN and PNP. And what the, these do is this drives the lights and then this returns it on the row. So this does the lights. We have our switch matrix right here. It has some buffers on it. Basically the buffers are there, so if there's a short circuit on the board, it fries the buffer, not your expensive microcontroller unit. An accessory port, this is used for things like extra power, uh, data connections, RGB lights, and also the servos. Here are our solenoid connections right here. The solenoids go through AND gates, and there's a watchdog timer right here. So if there's a signal and the watchdog timer is active, the uh, IRL 530 MOSFETs engage, allowing the coils to fire. And basically, 50 volts goes out to the coils, and then here's the return line from the coils, or negative, and then when the MOSFET is active, the negative is allowed to go to ground, which causes the coil to say, I shouldn't say fire, because fire is a bad word, it causes the coil to energize, creating a magnetic field which pulls the rod through it. Up here, I have a parallax propeller. This is the same chip that ran the old Bill Packs and Pinball game. It's still great for sound and video, so this actually does the audio off of one SD card, and then you can hook up a dot matrix display here. And here's its EEPROM. These are two shift registers for the cabinet switches. They're separate from the switch matrix on the board itself. And then over here, it's not populated, but this can actually run an old alphanumeric display like from a 1988 pinball machine and this circuitry here and these ports do that. And then we have an output here for the audio. Um, kind of the thought with this board is make it simple. You know, the person can put their own audio amplifier on, their own power supply, their own 50 volt supply, and this board just kind of runs it for them. So that's the board overview, the pin heck system. I didn't come up with that name, someone else did, but it's good. Now that I have the game basically flipping, I'm going to replace this manual shooter rod with this auto plunger, see how it'll just Kick the ball that way. So I've got to pull this out and put this in. I had to assemble it first. So that's what I'm gonna do next. All right, now it's assembled. Unfortunately, you can't make this in one piece because you have to be able to put the coil inside of it. So it's assembled, now I can install it on the board. Now we have the auto plunger installed. The servos are working, so the thing's move around on the board. We have audio and the dot matrix display. So I can actually show you the game fully working. Oh, the lights work too. Let's load up a ball and try it out. It 
So there is a uh, rule of demonstration. When the camera is rolling, you will do worse. It won't work and something will go wrong. But if you want it to work, just turn off the camera. Take this door. All right, if I hit the door, I get multi-ball. If I can hit the door. I mean, that's a dubious proposition. I can hit everything but that damn door. Yes, multi-ball. Well, there you go. Go squad! So there you have it, an overview of how to build a pinball machine. Now building pinball machines might seem like a silly, expensive, difficult hobby, and that's because it is. However, I've learned so much doing it. You know, I was back in my wheelhouse in the old days of uh, making game consoles and mods, and that's all well and good, but building pinball machines as a hobby has forced me to learn all sorts of new skills, and I've been able to use those skills in pay projects. So there's never any dumb project. If you have an idea for something, even though it might seem like it's, ooh, this is weird, what's the point, do it anyway because you'll learn no matter what when you make things. So I have Pinball to thank for forcing me to learn more about microcontrollers, uh, SPI buses, I squared C buses, interconnectivity, uh, serial lighting systems, all sorts of stuff I've learned just because I've been doing pinball. So always challenge yourself by building complicated projects and you'll always learn. Because difficulty causes learning. Because you know if you're like, oh I'm gonna go walk to the mailbox. Well I know how to walk to the mailbox. It's like I have to build a pinball machine. If you don't know how to build a pinball machine, you're certainly gonna learn more along the way and you're gonna be smarter at the end of it. So the moral of the story is, there are no dumb projects. Today's viewer question comes from Daniel who asks, how can I find old junk circuit boards to get parts from? Well, one source would be old computers. Everyone's got one laying around. Old computers are also a great source for ribbon cable, power supplies, and connectors. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we'll be discussing electronic interfaces, such as I2C and SPI. We'll see you then. Stay tuned at element14.com forward slash TBHS, where you can join the discussion, suggest builds for the show, and even have a chance to win upcoming builds. Remember, you can always email build ideas to benheck at element14.com. Thanks for watching.